this is Paul's plea. It's right out of the first verse there to this congregation. He has worked so hard for this group of people. And his call to the church of Philippi is stand fast. Stand fast. Don't fold. Honestly, in the original language, it's written more as a military term of hold the line. There's a defense. And he is pouring into the Philippian believers. I mean, he has, he has birthed this church. The Lord has, but God has used him. And so he is going back to them or he's writing to them. And he's saying, don't falter. Don't give up. Don't fold. Hold the line, Philippi. And Paul writes to this church that he planted some time ago, and you can hear his love for them in the titles that he gives them in verse 1. He calls them my beloved. He says that twice. Beloved is a term that's usually used for a man's wife. Essentially, Paul is saying in this passage, I am married to the church. We don't know everything about the Apostle Paul, but it seems as though he's at least a single man, maybe a widower. And so here he is. And he's saying, I have nothing to be married to except you. This is my ministry. This is who I live for, my beloved. He then calls them my longed-for brethren. He had worked hard to bring them to Christ. Hours and hours and weeks upon weeks of toiling, preaching, proclaiming the gospel so that this group, this body of believers would grow and grow and be self-sustaining. He calls him my joy. At this point while he's writing, he is writing in a prison cell. I mean, you can hear the clanging of his chains and he is saying, you are my joy. The one thing that I can look to is that God is using you elsewhere. And he finishes up by calling them his crown, his highest achievement in life, my crown. He then goes on to point out two issues that will cripple anyone from standing firm. Two issues, schisms and anxiety. Two things that will make you incapable of standing fast, of standing firm, of holding the line. They will cripple you and they will distract you. Both will would severely hurt a platoon of soldiers if they were fighting in themselves or if they had anxiety and they were just immobile, they wouldn't fight because they were scared, it would do a horrible, horrible thing on the battlefield. He says in verse 2, I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, this unnamed person to whom he is writing, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I think it would be good for us to be reminded how the letter of the Philippians and all of the early church epistles would have come to the churches. Once Paul wrote this letter, it would have been delivered. And we know that Epaphroditus was the courier of this letter based upon the end of chapter 2. And once delivered, church history tells us that that letter would be read in a Sunday service for all to hear. And then it would go from church to church to church to church. That makes verses 2 and 3 even more uncomfortable. Not only are these women's, Yodia and Syntyche's, thoughts recorded in a record that's even being talked about 2,000 years later, but they have just been called out in the middle of a church service. You been in one of those where the, the pastor said, hey, you, stop it. Yep, that's camp ministry right there. If you've ever been to camp, that's what the preacher does all the time. And that's essentially what Paul does in this passage of Scripture. He's miles away in prison, but he calls out Yodia and Syntyche, and he says, stop it. Be of the same mind. Listen up. Pay attention. Hold fast. Stand firm. Hold the line. Paul names names. In fact, he names four. He names Yodia. He names Syntyche. He names someone called True Companion or Suzugos. He's the recipient of the letter in verse 3. And he names a fourth, a man named Clement. We don't know much about either of these individuals, but here's what we do know. 
we know who these women are, or here's what we don't know. We don't know exactly who these women are. Some have suggested that they're charter members of the church of Philippi. Acts 16 tells a story about women praying by a riverside, and, and there that's when Paul goes and he feels the burden to begin a church in Philippi. It's possible that Yodia and Syntyche were some of those women there in Acts 16, praying that God would send a minister to start a church. We don't know. Some have suggested that they might even be sisters, that this is a family spat, and it's now eked its way into the local church. We don't know why they're at odds. Most likely, it's not a theological issue. Were it a theological problem, Paul probably would have corrected it at the very beginning because it would have helped the entire church. He was big on theology. This is probably a schism between sisters or sisters in Christ. By the by the parallel, when he says, I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche, it seems that they were both wrong. You've been in that situation? Both people are wrong. There might have been a, an initial transgression, but you hold it out long enough, you hold that grudge long enough, and let's be honest, you're both wrong. We don't know the story behind all of it, but Paul seems to suggest that they are both in the wrong here. But here's what we do know. And this is a hard contrast for us to get. These women were Christians. He says in verse 3 that whose names are written in the book of life. That these women will spend eternity with each other, with Christ. That they are Christians. And it might be a good reminder for us tonight, those of us who are possibly at odds with other people, that if they truly are a Christian, if you truly are a Christian, somebody better get over it because you're going to be spending a lot of time together in eternity. And here these two women are, and they're both believers. Both names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Secondly, we know that these women were dedicated. These weren't your average, normal, clock-in, clock-out churchgoers. These women, verse 3 said, they labored with Paul in the gospel. They were some of his right-hand helpers. It's possible that were they those in Acts 16 who prayed that God would send a minister to Philippi and there Paul arrives. It's possible that they were the ones who gives Paul his first audience. That they were his best soul winners as they would go out. That they were the ones who drew the crowd. These women were dedicated, and yet they're at odds with each other. Now here's the third thing that we know. These women are church members. He calls them my fellow workers. Here's the problem. Conflict distracts us from our mission. It's one of the most dangerous things in the church. Satan is never more pleased with the church than, we are dis than when we are distracted from our mission. He is never more happy with the children of God than when we are at each other's throats. The only, the only one getting any glory out of Yodia and Syntyche's schism is Lucifer. He's the only one. No matter who the original transgressor was, no matter how bad it was, the fact that they are unwilling to reconcile, Satan's the only one that's getting any, any leeway in the church in Philippi. And so Paul says, stand fast. You, you are distracted from your goal. You're not standing fast. You are standing oddly, idly by. So to remedy that issue of conflict between Yodi and Syntyche, Paul prescribes rejoicing in grace. Read verse 4 with me. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Particularly as it deals with these two feuding Christians, it's almost as if Paul is asking, when was the last time that you thanked God for saving your sister in Christ. Don't just gloss over, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. This isn't a everything's fine, just fine kind of rejoicing. You know, when your wife says everything's fine, it's probably not fine. This isn't that kind of rejoicing. But this is a call to sincere 
Even when we disagree, we strongly disagree with each other, I am still thankful that God saved you kind of rejoicing. That you were once heading to hell and God grabbed you out of that. I'm thankful. I rejoice. So Paul basically says, well, take a step back, Yodia. Hang on, Syntyche. When was the last time you rejoiced with, to God over your sister in Christ? I think that probably would stop a lot of our schisms in churches. It's if we just said, I'm thankful that God saved you. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ thought you were worthy enough to die for you. Verse 5 says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Hear me on this because this is probably some of the hardest of this passage to preach or hear or listen to, all of the above. The word gentleness in verse 5, it's hard to correlate to one particular term in English. You might have gentleness in your translation of Scripture. You might have graciousness in your translation of Scripture. There's several different ones, and they're, honestly, they're all about the same and pretty good. I would think that graciousness is probably the closest to come to the actual original intent. MacArthur suggests several other words, maybe phrases that we could say. He calls it sweet reasonableness, generosity, goodwill, friendliness, magnanimity, charity toward the faults of others, mercy toward the failures of others, indulgence of the failures of others, leniency, big-heartedness, moderation, forbearance, and gentleness. This is the kind of grace that even though you know the person is wrong, you still love them, and you still pray for them, and you still rejoice with them and for them. I think we can wrap up the entire idea that Paul is talking about here when we think of the idea when Jesus shook his disciples when he told them that if somebody slaps you on one side of your face, on one cheek, then you ought to offer them the other side of your face, your other cheek, which, by the way, stands in stark contrast to every red-blooded American, right? Right? That idea is ridiculous among all of us today. That if somebody punches me, okay, turn the other cheek. But that is what this graciousness is talking about. Paul is saying that you ought to treat each other so well, that you ought to give each other the benefit of the doubt so much that it is popular, it is made famous among all those around you, that you're a gracious people, that you have a sweet reasonableness about it. You could sit there like me in my situation or in a situation that I've gone through and we can debate and we can say, but they don't deserve it. They don't deserve even the opportunity to hit the other cheek. I know they do it and that's why it's grace. It is undeserved, unmerited favor with an almighty, holy God. But Paul says, stand fast. Don't give way to schisms or conflict. He says, rejoice. Everyone should know that the church is a people of grace. So he talks about schisms, but then he goes into something that I really wanted to talk about tonight. And it's a pretty hard issue to address. Anxiety. Verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Anxiety is a lot more subtle than conflict, but can be a lot more hurtful to the body of Christ. Conflict might distract you, but anxiety can cripple you into inactivity for the kingdom. There is nothing worse than needing a buddy on the battlefield and finding him in the fetal position unwilling, anxious, and scared to move. And I believe that in the local church, we have a ton of Christians who have allowed anxiety to have too much place in their life. Even an inch is too much. 
And so Paul writes to them, and he says, be anxious for nothing. And he goes on, he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here's where it gets tender, and I want to be careful here. We live in an anxious world. In a recent study that I read, professionals reported that over 40 million Americans suffer from some kind of anxiety disorder. I have several close friends who struggle and battle with serious forms of anxiety. I don't know why that it's your lot in life to go through that if you are. And I don't know why you have to battle it. And at this stage in my life, I I truly don't know why I haven't even come close to some of the battles that some of you have. But let me say this as tenderly as I can. Your diagnosis of a disorder does not exempt you from the command that God gives in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. That command is still given to somebody who has an anxiety disorder. That's not unloving. Paul is saying, don't let this rule your life. We live in a world of pendulum swings. Over here we have a group that claims anxiety and allows it to overcome defeat and harm them, thinking that they can't do anything about it, and so they live behind closed doors, and and they will medicate and medicate and medicate and medicate themselves into a coma. We have a real problem in our world today of people like that. But we also have a real problem on this other side of the pendulum swing where we have people who say that it's only a spiritual problem. And they'll just say, if you just got right with God, then you wouldn't have anxiety. Hear me. Both are dead wrong. Both are. It's ridiculous to think that one is right. I've seen godlier men and women than you or I or anyone in this room battle with this issue but I've also seen them live a life of victory and not constant defeat I have seen them battle hard and God reward and so before I even get into one final thought about this I would encourage you if that is you or someone in your life seek professional help consider medication But do not quickly bypass the Holy Spirit's urging here in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This past year, I read a book (coughs) entitled Spurgeon's Sorrows. It fleshed out what I had long heard of one of my spiritual heroes the British pastor in the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon. One of the heroes of the faith for sure. This man suffered and battled with extreme depression and anxiety for much of his life after he made the call to preach to an overpacked 12,000 seat auditorium. It was filled with people, many more than 12,000. There were actually 10,000 people waiting in the gardens just so they could hear him just a few words be preached or that his message would be relayed through those people. And he decided to preach one Sunday to that crowd of about 22,000 people in a much smaller venue than that. A horrible thing happened when a prankster yelled and screamed out in the middle of his sermon, fire, fire in the balcony. It wasn't true. There wasn't any flames. There wasn't any smoke. It was just somebody trying to distract from from the revival meeting. But the ensuing panic and stampede of humanity left seven dead. And Spurgeon took that to heart. He lived with that and felt it was his to bear his entire life. He is reported to, at times of his deepest depression, sit in his study for weeks on end, sleeping and eating in there, 
only coming out to preach. But he said this of his depression. I would go into the deeps a hundred times to cheer a downcast spirit. It is good for me to have been afflicted that I might know how to speak a word and season to one that is weary. He wrote extensively about using his depression for others, for Christians, for the kingdom of God, mentioning once that were it not for those deep troubling times in his life and in many others, many of the Psalms would never have been written. David wasn't always happy when he wrote some of the most precious Psalms that we sing and read. It was a depressing time, and Spurgeon realized that. But he submitted in his life that he would not allow his anxiety his disorder, his depression, to rule over him. And so to that situation, Paul says, pray. He uses three synonyms here. He says, pray, make supplication, and then ultimately he says, make a request to God. If I could read it in in the way that I believe it, it should be, when he says pray, he's speaking generally. That you ought to keep the lines of communication open between you and the Almighty. That it ought to be as natural as breathing in and breathing out that we pray consistently and constantly to the master creator of this world. Pray, he says, generally. But then when he gets into supplication, supplication has the idea of urgent requests. So this is the idea of I call out to God on a normal basis. I I have a normal call. I, I have a normal prayer time with him. But here I am in a pinch and I need you, Father. Peter exemplified this when he is sinking in the waves. And he says, Lord, help. Lord, save me. And that's exactly what this supplication here. It's an urgent request. And And Paul kind of summarized it all by saying, bring your requests to God with thanksgiving. And I would add, because it's, he knows, or you know, that God will hear you, and God will respond to you. And I want you to listen to the response that God will give you in verse 7. It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Think of that. God's peace will guard you. It's interesting to me that Paul starts the chapter by calling us to this attention to hold the line, to stand fast, to defend, to stand up, to fight. But then he ends this thought by saying that if we fall on Christ, He'll hold the line for you. That he will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if you feel weak and feel like you can't stand fast, and maybe some schism is is wearing you down. Coming through the holidays, maybe there is family relationships that they are hard and tough. And you feel like that's just, that's having, it's defeating you. Or maybe you are going through, as many people have called it, the post-Christmas blues, whatever you like to say, some kind of true anxiety disorder or something like that. The message is still to you, hold fast. Pray constantly. But also know that he hears your urgent requests and know that he will respond. And the way he responds is that he will guard your heart. When you feel like you can't guard anymore, when you can't hold the line, guess what? He's doing it for you. He's holding fast. He's standing firm for you. And I thought verses 8 and 9 would be a perfect way for us to go into 2018. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, 
meditate on these things. My prayer is that verse 8 will be the filter through which we view and say and type in 2018. That before we spew that hateful word, we will stop and say, is this true? Is it noble? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? Before we hit send, before we do whatever it is to get that information out there, that we would run it through the filter of Philippians 4.8. And verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. 2017 has been one of the most tumultuous years on records that many have said. It has been a year of natural disaster. There has been political turmoil throughout the world. There have been many other major issues that have come to it. And the thing is, is that the world looks at that and they say, well, I'll just drink away 2017 tonight. And I will wake up and all my problems will be over. And all of your problems will be compounded tomorrow, if that's your thinking. The only answer is the peace of Christ. And that's what he offers. That's what he gives freely. He says, stand fast. Hold the line. Be firm. You might be tired, but keep on keeping on. Do the things that you have seen me do, Paul says, that you've heard me preach. Do those things. Fall back on them. And when you do, you will find that he is holding you up. That he's standing firm for you. And the peace of God is ruling you in your 